On one fateful afternoon in Uganda, amidst the turbulent era of Idi Amin's terror, the imposing figures of the State Research Bureau, SRB, stormed the premises of the High Courts of Uganda. Their mission, to arrest a man who would soon vanish into the annals of history. From the chambers of the courts, he forcefully whisked him away, never to be seen again. But who was this enigmatic figure you might wonder, whose story defies the passage of time? His name was none other than Benedicto Kajimo Chuanuka, the Chief Justice of Uganda at the time. In this episode of Uganda in History, we embark on a remarkable journey through the life, legacy and tragic demise of Benedicto Chiwanuka, a man who championed the rule of law and whose unwavering commitment to justice left an illegal mark on the nation. In the heart of Chisambwa, Bukoman Simbi district, amidst the lush landscapes of Uganda, a man named Benedicto Chuanka was born. He was more than just a name, he was a living legend and a son of the soil, a testament to his indomitable human spirit. Benedicto, a proud Muganda by tribe, was destined for greatness, but his journey began with humble origins. Born to Kaketo Namugera, he was a son of a village chief, yet the odds seemed stacked against him. His family did not share his dreams of education, forcing him to carve out his own path by his own. It was at Villa Maria Primary School that his destiny took a new twist of fate. The benevolent Reverend Father Benedict Insuga saw the spark in the young Benedicto and fanned into a roaring flames of potential. With the new fund support, he continued his educational journey moving on to Bikira Primary School and later to St. Peter's College in Zambia. But fate has a way of testing the most resilient souls. When his father passed away, the mantle of responsibility of his family fell upon his shoulders. The weight of the financial constraints threatened to dim the light of his dreams. And then, as if summoned by destiny, the world war II erupted. And the young Chiwanuka had no choice but to answer the calls of the arms. He went on to join the King's African Rifles, rising through the ranks to become a sergeant major. But wars captured him into a formidable force, but it also left scars that would shape his future in unforeseen ways before. In 1946, he returned to Uganda, battle-hardened and ready to embrace the next chapter of his life. In 1947, love entered in his life when he married Mazengsia Zalwango, a union that would be a bedrock of his unwavering spirit. Now after the war, he sought the solace in the hallowed halls of justice working as an interpreter at the high courts of Uganda. Yet he thirsted for more. Now his quest for knowledge led him to South Africa, specifically to Basutoland, where he embarked on a matriculations course in law. With the sheer determination and brilliance, he did not only pass but excelled with flying colors. Benedict Chuanuka's journey was marked by sacrifice to finance his studies abroad. He was forced to part ways with his family land holdings and cattle, a testament to his unyielding resolve. Now, the Buganda government authorities were reluctant to support a Catholic, but he was a man who refused to let obstacles define his destiny. Now, as the sands of time continued to shift, Benedicto Chuanka's journey took him to the extraordinary odyssey. Now, following his low course in Lesotho from 1960 to 1962, he embarked on a voyage to London, seeking to further his legal argument in the prestigious University of London. Now, in a pivotal moment, he was called on to the bar by the Grey's Inn in February 1956, a milestone that marked the ascent of the legal luminary. Now London was a city of dreams and opportunities, but it was also a city where history unfolded in surprising ways. It was during his time as a student in London that the colonial authorities exiled Kabaka Edward Mutesa II. Now many Ugandan students distanced themselves from the king, fearing that their British scholarships would be jeopardized. Yet in the face of diversity, it was Ben Chuanuka and his compatriot Emmanuel Mbazira, both young law students who stood unwaveringly by the side of the Kabaka. Now, through relentless dedication and unyielding determination, they worked tirelessly with the exiled king during the turbulent times in London. Now, when Matteo Mugwanya ventured into London to champion the king's cause, it was these two law students who provided an invaluable support in navigating the intricate legal landscape. They even went on to secure the legal services of a renowned British lawyer, Mr. Duncan Forte, who skillfully drafted the legal case against the colonial authorities, ultimately securing the release of the Kabaka. Now, in 1956, Benedicto Chuanuka returned to embrace his homeland Uganda and to begin his illustrious law practice. 
Now his reputation soared as he swiftly made his mark on the legal arena, and one of his most notable feats was successfully defending the Bishop Chuanuka against the malicious accusations of Semakula Molumba. This courtroom trip further solidified his standing in the eyes of the nation. In 1958, Chuanuka's journey took a political turn as he was elected the President General of the Democratic Party, DP. Now with the characteristic resolve, he set about reorganizing the party, infusing it with a new foreign national perspective that had been absent in the earlier iterations. Now under his visionary leadership, the Democratic Party soared into popularity, capturing the hearts and minds of all Ugandans from all corners of the country. Now in the intricate tapestry of Benedicto Chuanka's life, political battles became another chapter, as he confronted the entrenched powers of the Mengo establishment. Their religious prejudices clashed with the aspirations of a Catholic politician aiming for the highest leadership. In 1961 general elections, Chiwanuka emerged victorious, securing his place as the first Prime Minister of Uganda. In his new role, he demonstrated a commitment to the welfare of the working class, raising the minimum wage for the laborers and increasing the prices of vital cash crops like coffee and cotton. Now, these policies ended him to the electorate, elevating his popularity to the new heights. However, they also sowed seeds of discontent within the colonial government, which viewed his actions as a challenge to the authority. Now, the Mengo establishment, in league with the British authorities, conspired to remove Chiwanuka from office, a move timed strategically from a scheduled 1961 general elections. Now, the British administration took its own steps, recalling the governor, Andrew Cohen, a moderate figure, and replacing him with Governor Walter Coates. Their mission to ensure Chuanuka's ouster before Uganda could attain full independence. Now, in this complex political landscape, the Mengo clique formed a tribalistic political party known as the Kabakayeka KY. Now, the party later joined forces with the Uganda's People's Congress UPC in a strategic alliance aimed at toppling Chuanuka's leadership. Now, the wheels of change were set in motion, and Dr. Apollo Milton Oboti emerged as the torchbearer of this transformation. Eventually, ascending to the presidency of Uganda. Now, amidst the shifting sands of the political change and intrigue of power, Uganda's journey towards the self-governance reached a pivotal milestone. The September 1961 Uganda's Constitutional Conference in London marked a turning point as the nation inched closer to self-determination. Now, on 1st March 1962, Uganda achieved internal self-governance, heralding into a new era of autonomy. Now, in the wake of the successful elections held in 1961, Benedicto Chuanuka assumed the role of the Uganda's first chief minister in the newly established National Assembly. Now, the alliance formed between the Kabaka Yika and the Uganda's People's Congress in 1962 bore fruit with a resounding defeat of the Democratic Party in the April 1962 polls. Now, though the elections were marred by controversy and allegations of irregularities, Benedicto Chuanuka displayed a remarkable act of statesmanship. He considered defeat, gracefully congratulated his rival, Apollo Milton Obote, and tendered his resignation. However, the political landscape was far from stable. In 1969, a series of unsuccessful assassination attempts on Obote led to Chuanuka's imprisonment by the Obote's government. Yet, fate took another unexpected turn. Now, immediately the coup that brought Idi Amin Dada to power, Chuanuka was among the 55 political detainees who were released and went on to be appointed the Chief Justice of Uganda on June 27, 1971. Even in this new chapter of life, Chuanuka remained a critical voice against the backdrop of the political changing tides. He later on fled the country when Obote's soldiers attacked the Kabaka's palace in 1966, only to return and face arrest on accusations of printing and publishing seditious materials three years later. Now, with Amin's rise to power, Chuanuka found himself once more in the center of Uganda's political drama. Amin personally received him and other political detainees at the Kololo airstrip. Chuanuka and his fellow detainees organized a massive rally at Najivuvo Stadium, rallying support for the new military leader. Yet, international recognition for Amin's presidency proved elusive. Now, in his new role as Amin's political advisor, Chuanuka ascended to the position of the first black chief justice of Uganda in 1971. However, the accolades did not shield him from the shifting sands of Amin's suspicion. Now, the military leader publicly accused Chiwanuka of being secretarian, casting shadows on their relationship. In May 1972, 
Chuanuka celebrated his 50th birthday and Silver Jubilee marriage anniversary. He wanted to extend an invitation to Amin, however, the president did not attend, foreshadowing the strains in their relationship. In August the same year, Chiwanuka penned a letter to Amin seeking clarifications on the reports that the president was tarnishing his reputation. Now, the already sore relationship took a further hit with the arrest of a British journalist, Daniel Stewart, allegedly on the orders of Amin. Now, the storm clouds of the political intrigue and the uncertainty gathered once more around Benedicto Chiwanuka as he continued to navigate the tumultuous waters of the Uganda's political landscape. Now, in the shadow corridors of power and justice, Benedicto Chuanka found himself embroiled in the high stakes of legal battle that would ultimately seal his fate. The case of the detained British journalist Daniel Stewart had become a hotbed of controversies, and no judge or lawyer was willing to handle it. In a desperate plea, the British High Commissioner turned to Chuanka, not only as the Chief Justice, but also as a symbol of moral courage. Chiwanuka agreed to take on the case even though some of his closest friends advised him to drop it and flee the country, sensing the storm that was brewing. As the shadow between the judiciary and the executive loomed, Chiwanuka decided to take on a brief respite, escaping into the wilderness of a hunting expedition with his childhood friend Chalton Suguga in Maogola in Masaka. Now, after the return from the hunt, and as the evening ascended and the stars began to twinkle, the two friends found themselves in deep conversations. It was during this poignant moment that Chuanuka confided in Nisubuga, sharing the difficulties he faced, particularly in the Stewart case. Suguga, according to many accounts, advised his friend to let go of the case and seek refuge abroad, but Chuanuka remained resolute. Now, before he departed for Kampala, he visited his village, bidding a heartfelt farewell to his mother and siblings, as if he sensed the impeding storms gathering on the horizon. Now, upon his return, Chuanuka issued a writ of Hapias Corpus, a powerful legal instrument, and sent a warning to the military against interfering with the workings of the judiciary. He took on a bold step by releasing the detained journalist, asserting that the army had no authority to detain a civilian. Now, the repercussions of this principal stand were swift and unsettling. Now, late in the night, Chuanuka received numerous phone calls and voices in the dark. One of the occasions, a minister summoned the Chief Justice urgently to the Parliament House, raising suspicions in Chuanuka's mind. He defiantly reminded the minister that if he wanted to see him, they could come to his office during his working hours. The Chief Justice cannot be summoned like a subordinate. Yet, nobody from the minister's side showed up the following day. Then came a call from State House, with President Amin himself on the line. Chuanuka's child went on to answer the call and the president's voice echoed across the receiver, demanding to speak with the chief justice. The line went silent when the child called for his father, and Amin waited patiently for Chuanuka to take the call. When the conversations began, Amin questioned Chuanuka's authority and judgment, asking, who is greater, the chief justice or the president? Did you say that we don't have authority to arrest the British? The room was tense as Chuanuka tried to clarify his stance, insisting that his judgment had been misconstrued and urging Amin to review the case files. Amin's anger flared and he abruptly slammed the receiver down. Chuanuka's family, sensing the growing danger, pleaded with him to flee for his safety, to seek refuge beyond the Ugandan borders. But the Chief Justice remained resolute, convinced that justice and truth were on his side. Yet despite his best efforts, Chuanuka could not escape the relentless pursuit of those who sought to silence his principled voice. The ominous specter of tragedy loomed over Ben Chuanuka as he attended mass at Rubaga Cathedral on the fateful day of September 21, 1972. Now little did he know that this would be his last public appearance. He went on to bid farewell to his wife as he offered valued words about his unfinished work at his office concealing the storm that was about to break over his life. As he exited the church, a car trailed him for hours. Their intentions were hidden in the shadows. His footsteps led him back to his office, a place of justice and integrity, where he had spent countless hours upholding the law. But on this day, armed men descended upon his office. Their faces were masked by malice. In a few view of bystanders, he dragged Chuanuka through the steps of the court premises, never to be seen again. Benedicto Chuanuka, once the Chief Justice now found himself stripped of his dignity and abandoned into a waiting car. As the engine roared into life, he was driven away from the world he knew 
a world where justice and the rule of law were his guiding stars. Now what followed remains shrouded in the dark annals of history. Chiwanuka's fate hung in balance as he was told to sign documents, a demand he resolutely refused. Now the details of what transpired next remains a mystery locked in the deep paths of time. Now the world went on to watch in disbelief. The Kenyan president, Jomo Kenyatta, made a desperate call to Amin, pleading for Chiwanuka's release. Amin's government, however, chose to obfuscate the truth. He concocted a document alleging that Chiwanuka had been abducted by Ugandan dissidents based in Tanzania, a claim that crumbled under the scrutiny. Now the accounts of Chiwanuka's tragic end vary, but the horror that unfolded on the September day is hinged in the collective memory of those that bore witness. Now some reports describe a prolonged but gruesome execution with eyewitnesses recounting the dismemberment of Chiwanuka's ears, nose, lips, arms, followed by disembowelment and castration before he was finally set ablaze. Now other sources suggest a more direct end, as Chiwanuka was personally shot by Idi Amin himself. The brutality of the death was a shocking testament to the depth of quality that marked that dark era. Yet Chiwanuka's death was not acknowledged as an execution. Amin instead publicly shifted the blame on Obote supporters and initiated a police investigation further obscuring the truth. Now the mystery surrounding the resting place of Benedicto Chiwanuka has cast a long shadow over Uganda's history, a haunting enigma that continues to evade resolutions. Now numerous accounts and speculations have emerged, each offering a fragment of the puzzle yet none providing a definite answer. Now some accounts suggest that Chiwanuka's body was hidden away by authorities and those who bore witness to the shooting met a grim fate silenced forever. Among the shadows, a solitary survivor named Hawa emerged living to recount the tragic tale of Chiwanuka's demise. However, he could not shed light on the location of his burial. Now over the years, efforts to unearth the truth have been made. In 2006, the Democratic Party which Chiwanuka founded organized a memorial mass to honor his profound contributions to constitutionalism in Uganda. The hope was not only to celebrate Chiwanuka as a hero, but also to uncover the mystery of his final resting place. The party spokesman at the time, Jude Mbabali, articulated the sentiment expressing the need for closure and dignified burial for Chiwanuka. Another account from 2012 introduces a woman residing in Magoye sub-county Kalangala district who claimed to possess knowledge of Chiwanuka's burial site. According to her recollection, a Land Rover carrying soldiers arrived at her home in Chuguli, Rwampera sub-county, which is now part of Nakasongola district. Her father, Yukana, was chosen among the villagers and directed to dig a grave near the village, approximately two miles away from Lake Kyoga. In this shallow grave, her father purportedly saw Chiwanuka's body accompanied by two others. The woman explained that her father could identify Chiwanuka due to his involvement as the Democratic Party activist and Chiwanuka's agent during the 1962 general election. However, she carried this secret to her grave, passing away in 1979. Yet another account, but this one from the Uganda ambassador to Switzerland, a son of the late Chiwanuka, suggests that the family was informed that Benedicto Chiwanuka was buried alongside the former Bank of Uganda governor, Joseph Moviru, and a certain Captain Mukasa. Now, this account points to a grave near the Makshoni Bay prison in Nuzira, where the bodies were purportedly interred on the orders of the dictator Amin. Chiwanuka was said to have been dressed in a suit and had a wristwatch. Now, this narrative was echoed by the Democratic Party in 2013, emphasizing that Chiwanuka and Mobiru shared the same grave in Nuzira. In 2018, the government of Uganda, in collaboration with the judiciary, took a significant step to acknowledge the enduring legacy of Benedicto Chiwanuka and his invaluable contribution to the country's legal landscape. A memorial in his honor was established and a striking monument was erected in front of the High Court building. This monument stands as a testament to his memory of a man who dedicated his life to the pursuit of justice and the rule of law. Now, in a poignant moment during this year's Ben Chiwanuka Memorial Lecture, President Museveni reflected on his own correction of the late Chief Justice. He wanted to acknowledge that he and Chiwanuka had been staunch supporters of the Democratic Party until Chiwanuka made fateful decision to accept the position of the Chief Justice in Idi Amin's regime, a time when the judicial independence was under severe threat. The President went on to express that Chiwanuka in some measure contributed to his own tragic end by aligning himself with Amin's administration. 
He emphasized that Chiwanuka became a martyr under circumstances that he shouldn't have been in the first place. The president also underscored the role played by the freedom fighters of the National Resistance Movement in removing those responsible for Chiwanuka's death, including colonial soldiers like Idi Amin and his associates. The Minister of Justice and Constitutional Affairs, Nobat Mao, also echoed the significances of acknowledging the past, saying that we should be happy like the Congolese even if we just received a tooth. He drew a poignant parallel with the recent events in the Democratic Republic of Congo where the family of Patrice Lumumba, an independence hero, had finally been able to bury his only remains, a tooth in the capital of Kinshasa, 61 years after his tragic death at the hands of the Belgian backed secessionist rebels. Mao's reference to the sober events underscored the importance of remembering and honoring the historical figures like Chiwanuka, whose sacrifices and contributions to shape the nation's destiny and aspirations. If you found this video informative and captivating, don't forget to give it a like, share and subscribe to help the channel grow. This has been Regan for Ugandan History and I look forward to seeing you in another video.